So in this video we'll look at the dawn of modern mathematics in the 17th century. And one of the reasons we call it this is because we have major innovations occurring in mathematics in a very short period of time, such as logarithms, codification of algebra, uh, science of dynamics beginning, a better understanding of our universe, and beginnings of geometries and probability, as all of this is leading to the creation of calculus. Uh, so we first look at one of the major inventors at the time was Napier, and, and he helped discover logarithms. Now his biggest thing here is he was tired of working through and having to do tedious calculations of multiplication and division. So he decided, how can I go about trying to make life easier? So his, he figured if I could find a way that I could turn anything into positive or into powers, we could turn fixed values of multiplication and division into something that would be equivalent in addition and subtraction by adding the exponents. So there we started to create logarithms. He created a book that received a lot of enthusiasm um, and he ended up working with people such as Henry Briggs on trying to create uh, and improve upon the concepts of logarithms. So. Henry Briggs, as said, worked directly with Napier in trying to construct logs, and together they came up with the base 10 log, or what we call our common logs. He also constructed trigonometric logs and was able to create log tables up through uh, from 1 to 20,000, then 90,000 to 100,000, and those tables were later filled in by other mathematicians. So if we think about logarithms, what we know is that X is, if x equals a raised to the y, then we know that y will equal the log base a of x. And we're using log just as an expressed idea. It could, they could have used anything for that term and they decided to call it log. And the interesting thing is that at the time, Napier and Briggs really were not very uh, understanding of the concept of exponents. So that is quite an improvement and an accomplishment that they weren't even necessarily using the concept of exponents to be able to solve logs. So if you're going to calculate using a log table, say we've got our two numbers here, 25 and 2 tenths times 120. First we'd rewrite them into scientific notation. So a times 10 to the b. So we have 2.52 times 10 to the 1 and then 1.2 times 10 to the 2, our a and our b values. First thing we would do is we look up the a value in the table of logs. So if I look up in a table, I'd find that 2.52 is about 0.401 and 1.2 is about 0.079. The next thing I'd do is I would add those two values that I looked up together. If the result is greater than 1, I'd have to subtract it because that value has to be within 1. So if I add those two together, I give up 48 hundredths. The next thing I do is I take that value and I'm going to look in the body for the closest number to that result. And if I look in the table, I would find the point oh, that 4800 falls at 3.02. So that's going to be my first part. That's my, my new A value. The next thing I do is I'm going to add my two B values. So in this case, if I look my two exponents here, 10 to the first, 10 squared, if I had to subtract 1 from here, like if this had been 1.48, if I had to remove that 1, I'm going to add that 1 back into my exponents because that's in essence what's occurring there. In this case, it was 0.48, so it's just add my two exponents and get 10 to the third. So I know that my multiplication ends up being 3.02 times 10 to the third. And you can go in the calculator and actually multiply 25 and 2 tenths by 120 and see that you get the exact same solution. Now, as people started to use tables, they decided that there had to be some quicker ways to use, to use logarithms. And one of those ways was the idea of using uh, a slide rule. And so Edmund Gunter developed a scale line which helped create the distance uh, between two numbers proportional to their logs. And that's how we started with the idea of the slide rule. Then William Ogtred actually used a pair of scales like Gunter's but did not need the dividers. And that became the first actual slide rule. And from then it continued to be improved upon until there was a standardized slide rule in 1850. Now the slide rule was widely used for about 300 years uh, in pretty much all forms of mathematics with very specific purposes, especially in aviation, engineering, economics, 
and even bovine measurements. Um, and there were different types depending on what it was you specifically were trying to do. And the three major types were the straight, the circular, and the cylindrical. Now, it rose to prominence because of how easy it was to use in comparison to a table. However, in the early 1970s, you see the, the rise of the scientific calculator becoming much smaller and much more affordable to the point where the slide rule was no longer needed because of what you could do with a calculator. Therefore, it has pretty much become just something you see in a museum. Uh, another famous mathematician at the time was Thomas Harriot of England, and he was thought to have introduced the potato to both England and Ireland, which is kind of a random fact for him. And he was the tutor for Walter Raleigh, one of our great navigators who came to uh, North America. Now, he is considered to be the uh, founder of the English School of Algebra, so this is very important when we think about our algebra that we have. He created a textbook that served as the early algebra textbooks and started to use powers not as we would do them with the notation of exponents but if it was a squared he would write a a if it was a cubed he'd write a a a he also included the concepts of inequalities uh, William Ogtred was another Englishman who was a clergyman and a math tutor and he gave us about 150 of our mathematical symbols we use in algebra uh, for instance, the idea of using an x for multiplication or a dot for multiplication, uh, using four square dots for proportion, and he would use the tilde for his difference, and a lot of the abbreviations for trig functions. Another famous astronomer and scientist and mathematician of the time is Galileo, and Galileo is a very prominent figure from this time uh, because he's one of the main founders in the concept of trying to provide an experiment to explain some theory he may have. He was sent for uh, to learn medicine, but it was the concepts of uh, a swinging pendulum that led him to leaving medicine to study mathematics instead, and he was appointed a, a mathematics professor at the age of 25. Uh, he often would do public experiments on falling bodies, and he was able to start showing a lot of different work about how the bodies would fall at the same rate regardless of weight. Now the problem was that his work uh, made him become un not very well liked by certain groups and he ended up resigning and going to a different school to teach because of this. Uh, eventually he created the telescope uh, which was funded actually by the government and he studied the heavenly bodies with this information and he then wrote a book uh, that was confirmed by the Copernican theory later however because his work started to show that the Sun was more of the center of our solar system the Inquisition forced him to redact everything he'd done in science and put him under house arrest for the rest of his life and his works were banned for over 200 years so a lot of the amazing works of Galileo he ended up not even having the credit during his time for doing. However, his concepts helped push forward many other famous scientists and mathematicians, such as Johann Kepler, who continued to study the planets and saw and created the first three planetary laws of motion. Uh, one, that planets move around the sun in an elliptical orbit, which is an, uh, a very radical thing at the time when you think of people be not being heliocentric. Uh, the idea that the radius vector joining a planet to the sun sweeps over an equal area in equal intervals of time. And then the last one being the square of the time of one completes a revolution is about its orbit is proportional to the cube of the orbit's semi-major axis. And this, some of the concepts he did served as a precursor to calculus um, because his second law there required some form of basic integrals uh, although he would do some approximations to help with that. Final person I'll talk about is Blaise Pascal and his work uh, was quite amazing for his age. He was able to prove that triangle was 180 degrees for some of the angles just by folding it uh, in its inscribed circle. He invented the first calculating machine at age 18 and he died though at a very early age which made many say that he was one of the greatest mathematicians that could have been. Uh, 
You look at concepts like the Pascal's triangle that he cre that he is considered to have discovered, although it has shown up in many other cultures, and all the different foundations that are within that mathematically. And he also did a lot of work with Fermat in the concept of building probability around this uh, problem that we'll look at called the problem of points.